everybody. Welcome to this session on whether companies can balance. I'm Julia Hobsbawm. I'm moderating this session with great pleasure with three tremendously accomplished women in finance and fintech from across the world. I have my own interest in the subject we're discussing. I present the podcast called The Nowhere Office. I'm just a uh, I've just completed a book called The Nowhere Office, which will be published in spring 2022. So I think you can guess a little bit my own perspective in discussing the question of how hybrid will work the impact across all sorts of areas of diversity of the post-pandemic RTO return to office. My view is that it's all in flux. Flexibility is in flux. The data is very conflicting. On the one hand, uh, everybody wants the flexibility by a majority not to return full time to the office, but everybody wants offices to continue. Uh, bosses of offices um, are extremely keen for people to return to work not least because in the financial services there is an enormous imperative to pass on at an apprenticeship level what can only be described as a sort of osmotic way to transfer skills and information it's extremely difficult to conduct um, certain kinds to build certain kinds of relationships um, by teleconferencing alone and yet everybody knows that some sort of pandora's box has been opened from the pandemic. And that's really what I'm here to um, moderate a discussion with. Let me introduce our speakers. They're each going to set out their own perspectives, their own geographical and professional and personal perspectives before we go into a discussion, which we'll see where it takes us. So our first, I'll just introduce all of the speakers and then return to the first person I'm going to bring into the room, as it were. And that is um, Harshika Patel. She is the uh, CEO of JP Morgan in Hong Kong. She also runs strategy across um, Asia Pacific for JP Morgan. She has, um, even though she looks incredibly young, if I may say so, she has nearly 30 years under her belt in the financial services. What I'm going to ask Harshika and all speakers to do is um, to bring any of their previous career highlights into their remarks, if it's appropriate, rather than give you a very long CV for each of them. But of course, they are all available online. Our second speaker, um, Harshika, joins us from Hong Kong, as does our second um, speaker, Michelle Chan. Michelle is the co-chair um, of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong, for whom she also leads business development, marketing and innovation. So she's got her finger on the pulse of an enormous range of uh, fintech companies and their perspectives as um, the region undergoes this transformation. And finally, we're joined from Stockholm in sunny but colder Europe by Paula de Silva, the head of transaction services at SEB Skandinaviska Enskilda Bank. So all of our speakers have got a tremendous uh, perspective of finance and also may I say because of their gender they will all have had some perspective of what it is like to face issues shall we say regarding flexibility availability work-life balance and the question of presenteeism in the office so let us begin please introduce the topic as you see it Ashika Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Julia. It's amazing what Zoom can do for creating a youthful appearance, even though I have been working for 30 years. So, as you say, I have been working in the finance industry for 30 years. But if I was to be very honest, the past 20 months have been a real learning experience for me in my own journey as a manager and how I think about the future of work and creating an inclusive environment. And I think it's very important to to actually look back at where it all started in January 2020 as to where I've got to and why I've got to uh, my views today. So taking a trip down memory lane, I still distinctly remember when the first COVID case was diagnosed in Hong Kong. It was the 23rd of January, a couple of days after the virus 
was first reported in Beijing. And I was due to leave uh, the day after for a trip to Japan. It was a business trip, followed by a very short Chinese New Year break with my very my two very young children. And frankly, I could never have predicted how the trip or the weeks ahead would unfold. Now, whilst the trip did go ahead, within five days of being there, our office is in Hong Kong and our clients were on heightened alert on visitors from Hong Kong and China. You probably remember masks and hand sanitizers were sold out to all those Chinese New Year holiday makers from China and Hong Kong. And when I actually came back to Hong Kong seven days later, our offices in China were shut and almost half the office in Hong Kong was work from home and the CNY school holidays had been extended, an extension that actually ended up lasting here for almost 14 months. As a mother of a seven-year-old and a three-year-old, that was a very long 14 months. So I was very lucky, though, however, that a couple of weeks after that trip to Japan, I was actually able to go to India to visit our corporate centre team, where we almost have 35,000 people supporting JP Morgan's global businesses, from commercial to investment banking. And in fact, that trip was the last time I travelled out of Hong Kong. Now, once again, whilst in India, they were on heightened alert on visitors from China and Hong Kong, the prospect of a local COVID outbreak and everyone in India working remotely for two weeks or within two weeks of that trip for the next 20 months was not something that they were ever certainly ever contemplated nor set up to do. And so why do I say that? Well, for much of our industry, business continuity planning up until COVID was usually about dealing with issues such as power outages, burst water pipes, protests here in Hong Kong, even earthquakes post, um, uh, post what happened in Japan a few years ago. Frankly, issues which prevented us from getting into our regular offices for a temporary period of time. And the backup plans were typically to work from an alternative site or transfer work to another city in the very worst case. A global pandemic was certainly not on anyone's contingency plan, and nor did it contemplate a situation where schools would be shut for such an extended period of time as they have been in large parts of them um, in Asia. Then if I reflect on the investment banking industry, which is where I come from, remote working was also not really a thing. You know, our businesses are very complex with a wide, wide variety of roles, it's a highly regulated industry. And frankly, our regulators around Asia Pacific didn't really even condone work from home in a business continuity uh, scenario. So if I had to hazard a guess, looking back in January 2020, I would guess that maybe 20 percent of our people were equipped to work from home as an alternative. But that would have been for a very short period of time, not for the 20 months that we have seen. So now when I look back, I think, you know, the Herculean challenge of getting 65,000 employees at JP Morgan in Asia Pacific to work from home in 16 countries, multiple lines of business, where markets were at their most volatile in a matter of a few weeks, I still remain amazed at what we in our industry were able to achieve. But what I've been even more amazed by in this part of the world is the resilience and the adaptability around the region that our teams have been able to show. 20 months on, only four of the 16 markets that we're in in APAC are actually back to work in a meaningful way. China, Hong Kong, Taiwan and New Zealand. Now, whilst for many, as you say, Julia, that work from home has been a very welcome change, for many in this part of the world, the extended period of working from home hasn't been an easy one be it in tiny apartments, children at home, extended family setups, and for some living on their own, the feeling of isolation. So that's why I said at the very beginning, for me now, as I reflect on the future of work and being inclusive of work, I think three things really resonate for me. You know, so for those 30 years, I was actually one of those managers where I wanted to be that manager who sat next to my team, monitored what they did, ensured that everybody came in at a certain time, because for me, 
that equaled productivity. My mindset now has totally changed. However, on the flip side, there isn't a one size fits all solution either to how we work, be it the nature of the job, the seniority of our teams, the time our teams have had in our respective organisations, and then some of the personal factors which I spoke about. I think all of these need to be taken into account when we think about designing solutions for our teams going forwards. And then finally, um, Julia, as I think about an office culture which embraces more flexibility and potentially, as you say, hybrid ways of working, I think it's key as managers that we're very conscious of our own proximity bias. Like I said, I was one of those managers that wanted to sit next to my people and see them every day. And I think it really is a natural instinct to favour people who you sit near and see more often. And I think as managers of a future workplace, we need to be mindful of this bias and really tweak our own manager toolkit so that we can flex how we measure our teams based on productivity and not how much we see them. Thank you so much. So much uh, to chew on there. I think the question of um, proximity bias and designing for solutions is going to be key going forward. But you've also painted a very compelling picture, lest we forget, of just how um, seismic the change and challenge has been. And I definitely think that part of the issue is is is, is to imagine a new future rather than to try and reframe old models, which suddenly seem very, very antiquated, something we can talk about. Um, Michelle, may I come to you, please, and ask you to outline your own perspective and experiences and those of your, those of your members? Mm, yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, the introduction. Uh, actually, uh, as that, I am talking on behalf of Fintech Association of Hong Kong, in particular because I'm taking care about the institute tech uh, sector. So I did have a lot uh, of observation and communication with our member company. And of course, on top of that, I did have some actual experience working in an insurer uh, during the COVID and during the social unrest and now the bank as well. So it was lucky or unlucky, we have already actually start some sort of work from home practice since 2019 uh, at least in my own company uh, before when I used to work in an insurer um, so we have gradually test different stress points to have 10%, 20%, 30%, up to 100% uh, staff work from home at the very beginning of the COVID so it was really a good practice when the situation was not that worse um, well I guess work from home practice in Hong Kong is much more convenient and easily manageable than uh, working from home practice in other parts of the world, given the geographic um, limitation and the uh, convenient uh, transportation within Hong Kong. So we can easily do the testing and do the setup as well. Uh, actually, Calling some example from our member company, I know one or two insurer in Hong Kong on actually 2020's COVID situation, they actually test 100% of staff working from home uh, once uh, during the peak of the COVID. And it was somehow proven the productivity didn't really lower very much. And in some part of the organization, even there is some productivity gain. And what they did in 2021 was uh, actually cut the van for two, four of their office in Taiku Pace and actually only keep one. And then they have actually um, launched a flexible working practice in Hong Kong. I admire them so much. My own company actually um, um, was not that flexible. Um, at this moment because we are still startup but then i can see very successful practice of working from home from a big organization as well so i guess it is not impossible uh, for working from home practice to be implemented successfully in hong kong uh, 
uh, the major or the most critical part would be the balance. Would it be totally work from home or actually how to maintain the balance um, to make sure the hybrid mode be operate smoothly in Hong Kong? So I look forward actually to further discuss and explore the possibility with the fellow panel here today. Thank you. Um, you've also painted a very vivid picture and I think it's worth saying my own framing of the issue is that hybrid is fantastically complicated. Mm. You know, the idea that we don't anymore have a one size fits all is probably something that those of us interested in diversity and equality and balance welcome. But the reality to make it work is fantastically complex. And so I think it would be wonderful if this session can help come up with some practice takeaways. Um, Michelle, I'm intrigued by what you describe as launching of a flexible uh, working practice in, um, in, in your organisation. I'm sure we want to hear a bit more about that. But now let's um, move uh, continents, let's move perspective. Maybe the picture will in fact be very similar to Paula de Silva. Paula, please give us your perspective. Julia, absolutely uh, glad to. Um, so obviously Europe is a, a very uh, not a area in, in this uh, particular topic, I think. Uh, I'm representing, I would rather say, the Nordics in, in this perspective where we are very similar. And just to give you uh, an overview, having worked in banking more than, let's say, more years than <laughs> Arshika. The, uh, the perspectives up here in the Nordics about working remotely is absolutely not any uh, anything special. We have done that always and for a long time, I think. Uh, also, it's quite, um, we have forgotten, I think, the beginning of the pandemic uh, where people were hoarding toilet paper, if you remember that. Uh, and where the uh, paper very much existed in the Nordics, being a really large paper exporter and, and of course paper mass exporter. Um, companies were trying to say there is no shortage of toilet paper here and yet we were drawn in the world economy by that and uh, not uh, having any need to do so. So it's quite a lot of, of um, that and we also drink water from the tap <laughs> and yet people hoarded uh, bottled water. If you think about that, it's really odd if we remember that uh, now. But um, we are a society where the Finns joke around, but it's actually some bit, for instance, where they say finally the restrictions are over and we don't need to adhere to two meters of each other because, because we can go back to our five meters. So this is also another perspective of, of society. Quite few people are in digital environments. We have no, uh, you know, physical money, for instance, which changes our our industry quite uh, quite a lot as well versus other places. So I think uh, what did happen though was that the process of doing banking services changed. Maybe five years in fact, where digital signatories um, uh, and signatures and digital ways of working just became. Uh, not um, from um, you know a normal way, but maybe the whole process changed into becoming digital because maybe that was a difference before. Points were digital, but the hope was not, and and we could see the shortcomings and the gaps as uh, the pandemic uh, passed along. So that changed quite uh, quite a lot. I think the biggest hurdle we had was to have people in different different locations so that you didn't have the be that the uh, trading room or or a department with toxic systems like payment systems and so forth them being in the same in the same building so that was i think the biggest hurdle to split people out in different um, cities and even in different countries to complement each other should an outbreak really be large in a specific place so that is is um, something that i bring with me are on how do we actually use our our physical space uh, the other things about working for from home, um, because it was quite clear that we shouldn't use the public transportation, that became really easy in a way. I agree with you, Julia, the, the mix 
mix of working hybrid. That's what we need to still uh, to still uh, work on, because I I think that we had two things that worked perfectly. One was to get customers to adhere to meetings cross border. That happened immediately, fantastic, because everyone sat on Teams or on any other of the uh, of the. Um, uh, public uh, ways of, of speaking to, to each other. Uh, and also we could um, to teams filling out for each other from different countries. So uh, not needing to be in the same office at all. So hybrid has not been the thing. It has been all digital. As we come back to the office now, if you have two people in the same room, three online, that's the bigger, bigger hurdle I would say. How do you actually give this? And we are still working on that. Uh, somebody mentioned about isolation and, and the loneliness that people have felt, and I think that has been extremely vivid, and, and maybe that has been the bigger thing as well, because if you live in a smaller apartment or whatever your life situation is, if you are young and you have a very small apartment, you actually use your um, dining room table maybe for uh, your workspace, that doesn't work so so well. So there was quite a lot of, of details that has been worked out, and also can people have their home as the office we're still debating that is that you know do we then as a, an employer and that's something i would like to really hear from all of you uh, as an employer do we have people's home as our workspace and what does that entail in terms of both liability uh, and also you know uh, people's health and safety how much are we then responsible for for that um, so look forward to uh, to the panel discussion as well Thank you. Yes, I think um, what I'm hearing from all of you, and Paula has really crystallised this, is that perhaps we need to um, talk about uh, three three P words, uh, productivity, practice and process, and of course, the personal, because it seems to me the whole issue of work-life balance has come into the workplace more precisely uh, than at any time, um, actually in a hundred years, if you think about it. Um, and that's what's really interesting. I thought, Paula, your, your perspective also brought in the question about behaviour change and how ready we are to make, to make those adjustments. And perhaps we can begin with that question about how ready the financial system is for behavior changes of humans in a machine world. So Paula has expressed the question very well that the technological changes just accelerated. And I will remind you of the figure that um, globally companies spent $15 billion a week upgrading the technology to assist working from home during the pandemic. So the world has pivoted to be capable of working from home. The question is, what are those behaviours going to feel like? Um, can, I, can I start back to you, Harshika, because you were very honest talking about the culture of presenteeism. How are those behavior changes which are possible from technology really going to be culturally tolerated, do you think? So I think, like I said, the last 20 months where, to Michelle and Paula's points, that um, we have demonstrated we can be very productive from home. I think the mindset around presenteeism, not just myself, has come, you know, multiple steps forward. I think this whole debate around why organisations want their employees back in the office for some chunks of the week is largely because what I think we've all missed out on are some critical components around collaboration, networking, junior talent development, integrating uh, new joiners into our organisation. They're all the softer things that technology is unable to deliver. So for somebody like myself, who's been at JP Morgan for eight years, working uh, through Zoom with colleagues in New York or London has been fine because I had a pre-established relationship with them, which meant that a 30 minute Zoom will still have five minutes of exchanging pleasantries and finding out what's going on in each other's life. Now imagine, 
if you're an analyst or you're new to an organization, that conversation on Zoom looks very different because it's much more transactional. So I think solving for, for that is what I think organizations are really focused on. Then there's that whole element of the, the water cooler uh, machine conversation, just general collaboration and, and networking that goes on, which isn't deliberate because every communication on Zoom has to be a deliberate one, right? Versus if I'm standing by the water machine and I bump into you, right? We can actually have a conversation and it can be social or it can actually turn into a very productive work conversation. And I certainly work in an environment whereby ideas come up, not because we're sitting in dark rooms and thinking, oh, let's come up with an idea. They come up because you're just having random and informal uh, conversations. So I think technology has helped us work from home. Technology has certainly made us a lot more productive. By the way, I've never been late for a meeting in the last 20 months because when you're doing every meeting on Zoom, you haven't actually got to go to another office. However, for large parts of the organization who haven't been here for as long as me or as tenured as me, technology doesn't enable them to buy into the organization and make the friends that they might need to. Thank you. Michelle, I'd love you to share what you alluded to with flexible working practices, which speaks to Harshika and Paula's point about the sort of asymmetry of trying to manage Zoom and teleconferencing based presence with real presence. If we leave to one side um, the, the, the challenge of managing serendipity, which is most definitely going to happen and which will, I believe, um, will be the USP of the office, will not be what you do at a desk. It will be, you know, manage serendipity where you hang out at the water, you come in to hang out at the water cooler. But but M Michelle, give us a taste of some, some best practice that you think is developing. Sure, sure. I just want to echo what Hashika just mentioned, because I, I think um, actually uh, purely work from home practice may not really work for uh, an organization with a lot of people actually new to the company, like a startup, uh, because this is part of my personal experience. I joined my current company actually last year. So I'm pretty new to the organization and a lot of new colleagues actually also join at a similar time. I can tell actually from a manage point, management point of view how hard is to manage a team of people who actually are new to the organization and new to each other as well. Because without the personal casual touch, um, it's very difficult to build trust and also um, uh, the, the working um, uh, like, I mean, um, um, a normal working practice between uh, the team. So uh, after the COVID actually become more stable, um, we actually spend a lot of effort to uh, build team uh, spirit once again, a lot of team activity, but under COVID, you know, uh, managing a big team is not easy. So we can just set up a lot of small team uh, group activity, sometimes even leveraging on the virtual team building activity we have set because last year, my team actually sponsored a virtual one event. It was supposed to be a consumer event for our customer, but then eventually it proven quite effective for us to manage um, inter-company and intra-company uh, team building as well. We actually invite our shareholders, company staff, as well as our own company staff for different sort of competition, that sort of things. And after the team building activity, we measure the comment and also the feedback from our staff. Actually, uh, we see quite significant increment between the trust, between the uh, inter-department communication and also inter-company uh, communication among the staff as well. So what point I want to emphasize is that uh, work from home or remote working actually would help to boost up the eff uh, efficiency uh, if 
all the organization, all the staff are quite familiar with the company, the work model, their buddies within the company already. But for a startup or a new company with a lot of new stuff, probably it needs a lot of effort, not just on the technology side, because technology size can make all sort of communication remote or possible. But for the human touch, for the shots building, for the morale building, actually is much more difficult to manage, which or uh, every of the management, I believe, need to put extra focus on that as well. So this is what, uh, well, I personally actually experienced in the last 12 months. So what I'm what I'm picking up from those comments that were very useful is that really no one is saying there is a single model that can work. No one is saying that fully remote is going to become mainstream, which isn't to say it doesn't exist amongst some tech companies. Uh, there's an appeal to certain demographics, I would call the digital nomad, uh, especially Gen Zs, obviously, those with caring responsibilities are far less able to work from a desert island. Um, and yet, the teleconferencing mix is going to be here. And Paula, I wonder whether one um, emerging theme will be some norms about not just the right to reflect request flexible working in the UK where I'm from, the government is consulting on an immediate right to request rather than only after six months of being employed, but whether some norms will emerge about the right to say, oh, I'm going to join you digitally when you're in fact expected in person, because these are sort of new cultural uh, imprecisions, aren't they? Paula, what's your view about that? Are employers going to start saying, yes, you can be hybrid and join remotely on the day that you're hybrid, but when you're expected in the office, you have to have a jolly good reason to join digitally? No, I certainly agree with you. And, and I think the title of your book, uh, The Nowhere Office, I think is very interesting. Um, and is that feasible? And how crisp can we as companies become when it comes to culture? Because what culture do we want to foster? Because that's what we do when we say that we have to be in the office and we talk about what we want to achieve. It's not only about our, our goals uh, that are our KPIs, it's about being someone for the company. And is there a difference then in culture, particularly between one bank and the other? Just mentioned the example of JP Morgan and SCB. We do the same thing in, in uh, somewhat uh, uh, different and somewhat the same countries. Is there a difference of culture? And do we create that ourselves in that case? Or is that something else in the air? So the presenteeism, I think, is extremely interesting. If you are by the water cooler all the time and you actually kind of imprint your own ideas, is that a culture foster? Or is there other better people uh, on creating that culture that are remote and have to call and be more proactive to um, get their, their uh, ideas across? And how crisp do we need to be and, and want to be? Should we write that down? In our company, we try to do this. We try to do less of that. Because I don't think that if I try to find somewhere where the SEB culture exists, I don't think that exists anywhere. It exists in people's head and in the crossroads where we meet. So I think we need to agree on a lot of things. For instance, business critical traveling. I think we've all heard about that. That's what we do. So now what is that for us? Is that actually meeting a fellow a colleague in another country because we are doing a big change? Or does that necessarily have to be customers? Is it investment banking versus transaction banking? Is that a difference? So I think we will foster a culture by being crisp on these things. Maybe choose away from some of the water cooler things that we might not want as well. So I think that that's a, your question is interesting. If you have to be in the office by Wednesday uh, and you're not, is that okay? Or how do you then create the culture? Thank you. So we've touched quite a lot on, um, on process and practice, and I'm sure we'll circle back to them. But I'd like to pick up on the point that you just made. And let's talk very specifically about productivity, because it's also, if I can bring perhaps an unfashionable word in, it's also about power, isn't it? Who has the power? And what is emerging from this pandemic is that talent is much more powerful than it used to be. 
So 50% of workers in the professions in an EY survey said they'd be prepared to move job within a year if they weren't given flexibility. A similar amount in the Edelman Trust Barometer said that they would be prepared to take action and challenge managers if they didn't think that they were behaving in a proper purpose-built way. So we are seeing, aren't we, a power shift around um, the means of production, if we want to be really old fashioned in our language, which is who controls those means to production. And I, I want to ask Harshika, how is that going to work out, do you think, for very um, old school models of finance where you attract talented people in and you really handcuff them with amazing perks, pay, promotions. What if people don't quite want that anymore? And they say, I can be just as productive as, you know, on a hybrid basis. So what are the politics of power and productivity? Enormous question. <laughs> Answer it as best you can, Gosh. please. We'll start with you. <laughs> I didn't know finance I didn't know finance was an industry that paid very well and had great perks. I need to go and find that job. Um, no, in all seriousness, wow, it is it is a huge question. Um, and I'll answer it in a couple of dimensions. I think when people say that they want flexibility, it means different things to different people, right? So I'll take two people who work for me. I have one lady who has a four-year-old daughter. She has no help at home. And with the pandemic, the help that she did have pre-pandemic has now gone back to the Philippines. So the flexibility she wants is that at 4.30 every day, she goes to pick her daughter up and then logs back on again at 6.30, 7 o'clock after she's bathed her daughter um, and had dinner together. That's absolutely fine. I have another individual in my team um, he's 31 years old, he lives on his own, and he can't think of anything worse than not being in the office Monday to Friday. But the flexibility he wants is to be able to go and do a yoga class for an hour and a half at lunchtime. And can you accommodate there are that? Some. Absolutely, because this is where managers... So, and it comes back to, like I said, my own mindset shift. As a manager... I need to work hard on putting in parameters around what's really important. So what's really important is they're productive, right? However, they want to be productive. So therefore, I need to be clear with them on what productivity actually means. Now, if you're a trader, if you're a banker, if you're a salesperson and you have a revenue number next to your name, that productivity is very easy to manage. If you're an operations person who processes all of those transactions that those individuals enter, you know, um, commit the firm to, also very easy to manage. If you're a tech person, the metrics are very simple. You have X number of projects to deliver, right? You need to also keep the lights on. If all of that happens, you've achieved your targets. And in my role, for example, where I run strategy for the region, it's very much like a consulting firm in terms of the team are engaged on multiple strategic projects at any one point in time. As long as the stakeholders are managed in terms of what is going to be delivered, when it's going to be delivered, it does. It should not. It should not bother me that one individual wants to leave at 430 and log back on at seven. Or one individual wants to go to do yoga for an hour and a half. What is important is that they then signpost this to the rest of the team. Because where the team harmony gets disrupted, right, is if you don't signpost, so let's take Paola as an example. She's my, you know, her and I are working on a project together, right, and she's expecting me at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday to work on something together in the office, and I ring her up and say, actually, I'm not coming in today. That's actually not good. For the project, nor the team dynamic, nor, frankly, the company culture that we're trying to build. But flexibility, where it's actually signposted, right, and you're explaining to your colleagues what you're doing and being intentional about it, I think 
is something that managers could could accommodate. Now, I can't speak for every role in finance, but for the ones that I'm aware of, I think it's accommodatable. Thank you. Paula, I'd like to come back to you and then and then Michelle. Just pick up on that point um, mm. a little more on on the politics of, of purpose. So Harshika has presented a really credible, I can visualize it, what does success looks like is a realignment um, where you say these are the measurements per job, uh, this is the culture, we're all in it together. But is that enough, do you think? Because the purpose agenda has moved into the center of the room. It's, br it's brought in all aspects of the supply chain, uh, awareness of climate, and an awareness of fairness. Do you think that the financial industry is going to have to make itself more attractive to new generations because ultimately it's going to have to preserve its reputation for you know growth and contribution to society and all the things it struggles to do so so what is what does the fintech sector have to do to address this shift towards purpose no but i think it is a big question as you said harsh again and you know it's not not one fits all, and that's extremely important. And yes, I think we have all been very, very accommodating to listen to people. And it has been, in that sense, I think, really easy to accommodate exactly those types that you just mentioned, and, and many more, where people have, you know, they live away from, from the office, or they live very close to the office, and so forth. So, you, you know, we have been able to do that. I think what it puts the finger on is more the leadership and that's what I've tried to, to focus on as well. So what kind of leadership do you need to lead these new people that come into the office and have a different mindset? And and that has challenged me a, a lot because, you know, it, the captain is the last to leave the ship, right? That's what we are born with. So you are in the office and you are in the office in the old world longer than anyone else because you are the boss. Now, in the pandemic, I just realized and many with me that it was really stupid to be in the office because if I got sick, uh, uh, then what would, would, would happen? Um, and also the other managers, if, if everyone that was in the office, only managers all got sick, the other ones didn't. How good would that have been? So it's actually the opposite of everything right now, I think, in many aspects. So by then, we all went home, basically, in a structured way, but still. And I think that turned the pyramid upside down. If you need to, to uh, be safe, well, start with yourself. You know, it's like you put the oxygen mask on you and then you put that on, on the next one. So that changed uh, the whole specter of things. Um, the other thing is, um, we, as you said, Harshka, it's very often in, in our industry and in many other industries that we have hard KPIs. You know, you sell for this amount, but you also want behavioral KPIs. And, and that's what I think we have been discussing quite a lot and continue. We have a, a workshop series with all my managers uh, globally that is called transformative leadership because it requires us to discuss what we need to do. Yes, and I'm really picking up the, the, the desire to be open to what is emerging and what is changing. Michelle, we've talked a little bit about this in relation to the residual fear of going back to work, the residual threat of COVID. Um, there's also the threat to the old way of um, office occupancy on the new sensibility around impact on climate and uh, emissions and travel. How much do you think behavior and values are going to drive these changes that we're all experiencing and witnessing? How much of it's going to just be what, what people feel, not the policies from above? Well, I guess after the long, long COVID period, I would say a lot of my colleagues and a lot of our members' staff also showed are uh, very much eager to work in office back to their normal working life. And of course, they would still expect some sort of flexibility in terms of um, uh, whether or not totally work in office or totally work at home. But then most of them, around 70%, we have done um, casual survey with some of our member company indeed. Uh, many of the staff actually show 
oh, they actually feel very positive to go back to work like they used to, to be. Uh, and of course, some of the management um, do want to see whether or not they can boost the productivity and cut part solely of the course to allow part of their staff to work from home because remote working actually would solve some of the Wento problem in Hong Kong as well. As you, as you know, the Wento in Hong Kong is always high. So if they can actually keep the company expanding, keep the productivity increasing, yet to limit the rental investment, they would help the operation um, a lot as well. So, so I guess it is not uh, something uh, we need extra effort to manage people's expectation to get that back to work, at least here in Hong Kong. Uh, it is a matter of how we can actually set things up to allow a whole new working model to encourage them or to come back to the office, yet we can manage the operation costs, we can manage the productivity, uh, as well as to set up the principle to make sure the operation be smooth and also some sort of um, practice to encourage interdepartment or um, how to make sure the new staff on board with um, some sort of special attention from their colleagues and also the management as well. So that sort of things is what uh, probably we need to take care most after the COVID, after all the organization get ready to put their staff back to work in normal, in the new normal, always you say. Thank you. Yes, the new the new nowhere normal, as I would put it. Um, look, we've we've already nearly run out of time. We've got five minutes, and of course, what I want to do is ask each of you to sum up. And I'm going to give you a magic wand. I'm going to say, what are the couple of things that you would like to shift around the question of um, of 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 hybrid working successfully? Is it to standardize days of the week? Is it to have a shared um, forum? You know, maybe Cybos can become the World Economic Forum of convening the ideas around how hybrid is, is understood. Is it that you want to be able to build the culture in as best a way you can? What does success look like to you? And I'll I'll start you off with my own vision of what success might look like. And it is a reform of HR. It is a reform of the way people are recruited and managed and their performance is appraised and the balance of technology versus in person or in screen hearing of their experiences. It is to reconnect the human in the machine era because COVID has connected people to their lives. And that seems to me the, the challenge that we're all grappling with. So I'm giving you a magic wand. Maybe you don't want to wield it, but 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 give us what is what is on your mind now from this discussion? Do you do you have a single solution you'd like to put into effect or what has interested you about what your fellow speakers have sent? And I'm going to start with Paula um, from uh, the, the, the European and specifically the Nordic perspective, because you you got there first on flexibility. You've been pioneering as a region the question of diversity friendly policies around working hours and working place, which is really what we're talking about. I think we are not as diverse as we would like to be. We have not put all the uh, workforce in place yet in uh, that mirror society and so forth. So we are by no means done, uh, neither on gender nor on, on any other diversity. But yes, we are really working on it. And I think we've come a bit on, uh, on our way. Uh, you said it's a transformation of, of HR for success. I think it's a transformation of HR in management. So it's back to to uh, us as much. How do you treat HR? How do you want um, um, your output to be? And what kind of behaviors do you think is needed for that? So collaborative measurements, ways of, of working that uh, that are productive and, and that where you can measure output in teams, not only the hard facts, but the soft facts. I think that is the focus going forward. And that's why this transformative leadership um, um, effort that we are trying to do is to 
for you to understand what it is that you need having those goals. How do you create this higher purpose? I think it demands much more from management, not only from the uh, employees. And we will get there. It will be really cool attracting those young uh, talents in a, in a different way than we did before. So personal responsibility from management, the purpose of leadership is, is, is your takeaway. And um, Michelle, you've got a magic wand. Where are you waving it at in terms of changing the status quo, which has already changed because of the pandemic? I see. I, I think I would say um, actually it's also the transformation of the management's mindset about uh, human management or staff management, because I can see actually the flexibility in terms of working, how to make things work is harder nowadays, but still there is a lot of company still uh, quite limited in terms of um, the working model. Say, for example, I know some friends, actually, they are planning to relocate from Hong Kong to somewhere else. So from my point of view, if the management mindset change a little bit, actually, a lot of work can we mold again. So we would allow the same staff to work remotely from other part of the world. So that's sort of thing related to pandemic and not related to pandemic is also about how uh, the management change in terms of the mindset, how thing, how people think uh, we can manage our staff uh, locally or remotely. If things can set, I mean, if the framework can be well set, uh, also the work group can be more flexible, um, well, then a lot of human resources issue can be solved because uh, I, I, I'm I sure Paula may also aware a lot of relocation cases happened in Hong Kong recently. Um, just uh, within this uh, six months of the time. So I guess a lot of human resources um, issue can actually be fixed and better managed if uh, the management or HR actually be able to be more creative in terms of how the job scope can be can be can be set and tuned as well. Great, so thank you so I much. So, cre so creativity. Um, the last word in about half a minute to you, Harshika. Uh, what is your what's your takeaway from all of this? And do you have a magic wand? No, so there is no magic wand. I think for without repeating anything that Paula or Michelle have said, I think it's unfair to ask our organisations to solve this big topic for us. There are thousands of managers at organizations, at SEB, at JP Morgan, right? Everyone needs to take control of their own teams. They've all had firsthand experience of how their teams work, how their teams can be most productive. So why don't you, manager, design a solution for your team rather than waiting to be told from up above what you should be doing? That's number one. I think number two, Paula touched upon this slightly, earlier, if we are going to have hybrid, to be really inclusive, you need to make those folks who aren't working in the office to feel part of team meetings. So if I had one quick ask, team meetings to then be on Zoom, so everybody occupies the same tile, as opposed to seven people in a room and two people on Zoom. Well, that was a fascinating discussion. Uh, it was very honest and it covered everything from presenteeism to productivity and the politics of this extraordinary moment that we're in. I'd like to thank very much our speakers, Harshika Patel, Michelle Chan and Paula De Silva. And I'd like to thank you for participating, as I'm sure you will, on the chat. And this subject isn't going away anytime soon. I'm sure we'll be back talking about it in a year's time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.